Oh, he's the shove it man. Oh, he's the shove it man. He's gonna shove it. He's gonna shove it. Alright, my shovers, it's been a while since we've watched some NWA TNA. I thought it'd be a nice way to round off Week of the Hawk. This is a new Halloween tradition, just like watching What Culture and Pissing. I'm still doing two episodes in one video, but I will need to trim this footage down just a bit as I don't have the time. It sure flies like the Hawk, now let's talk. Last time out on the NWA TNA show, they flat out lied to us when they promised that D'Lo Brown would get five minutes alone with Russo because he won a match. But when it just came down to it, it never happened, and Dilo was battered by six people. It pissed me off, and I'm sure it did you too. But we start the show in the best possible way. Dilo Brown challenges for the NWA title that belongs to AJ Styles. He has Trinity with him, who's looking like a boss as always. This will be a two out of three falls match with Russo barred from ringside. The first fall will begin with a straight up singles match. Dilo Brown with the first two count after a diving clothesline. There's no hanging around in this one. They're trying the big moves early, which are admittedly all getting reversed. It turns out to be a fairly easy match for AJ Styles because Trinity is interfering. This enables him to hit a springboard splash. Although that doesn't get the job done, the ref is distracted and Sonny Don't Look At My Asiaki interferes and helps AJ Styles get the 1-2-3. I have to question what the point is in barring Russo from interfering if it's fine for anyone else to do it instead. The second fall will be later tonight. The directionless Elix Skipper is out next to cut a promo. He tells the cameraman to focus on his abs. He issues an open challenge because he's a bad man. Completely randomly, this is how Crash Holly debuts as Mad Mikey. He's pretty much playing the same character as in WWE, but now he's angry with a kitten t-shirt. Crash scores a few simple knockdowns including a turtle world backbreaker. Crash thinks about climbing to the top rope but changes his mind. Oh, now he's going to the top. He dives and lands on his feet and jumps up into a splash. He calls this move the hop splash. NWA Impact brings you the smack of the week. Sponsored by all new Blonde for Men. If you're a brown haired potter, put some blonde in it. It makes you look hotter. It's cousin Crash, man. This guy's going to the top rope like Superfly Jimmy Snooker. What he got here, man? A hip hop drop or the flip flop and hop? Man, that's ridiculous. You ain't gonna keep down an athlete and eat a skip a caliber that easy, man. That was the NWA TNA Smack of the Week. Sponsored by Blonde Just for Men. Get it? Got it? Shove it. This isn't enough to keep Skipper down, surprisingly, who grabs him and nails a reverse suplex across the ropes. Skipper quickly follows that with a big leg drop, crushing Crash against the ropes. Crash fights back with a wheelbarrow into a pin for a two. Skipper simply grabs him and throws him overhead. Crash stamps his feet in pain. Crash is already really over this crowd. He reverses the next move from Elix Skipper and hits a net breaker for a double down. When they get up, Crash drops Skipper on the ropes and hits a bulldog. Skipper kicks out, but he's almost beaten again moments later when the head scissors drops him on the turnbuckles. Crash apparently misses his old gimmick and he snatches the scale from Skipper's corner. That proves to be a bad decision as when he turns around, Skipper smashes him with a massive wind-up slam. Elix Skipper is the winner. What a way to debut. We go to a video package now about Jeff Jarrett and Joey Legend, so I probably skipped it. Or should I say, I skippered it. It sucks. Unfortunately for me, the package just build up to a promo battle between these two men. Joey Legend is still doing his annoying catchphrase, which is no, no, no. That's exactly how I felt when I saw this segment. He doesn't like the pro-American crowd. He reveals that he's hired a black cert security team, whilst at the same time calling them poor scumbags. They are instructed to protect Legend from slapnuts. He will be in a handicap match against Alter Boy Luke and Matt Seidel. What a random matchup. They both immediately dodge him a few times. They try a double sunset flip, but they aren't strong enough. He does a double duck down and springs up into a double clothesline, to be fair it's a nice spot. Alter Boy Luke is sandwiched between Legend's back and the map. Not sure what Seidel was going for here, he looks like he's arguing with a fan. Seidel does come back, but he's quickly hit with a sort of sit out spine buster. Alter Boy Luke is back on his feet though, so Legend has to sort him out now. He gives him what looks like an F5. Now, a wild slap nuts appears. He's just here to watch the match from the ramp. The cruiser waits for some teamwork now and they manage to get a two. Alter Boy Luke tries to dive but Legend gets him on the top rope. He ends up with both the men on his back and falls back to the mat with them. Don West calls it the piggyback stunner. It ends seconds later with a move they call the stone cutter. Looks more like a grease cutter. Slapnuts is happy that the match is over and he rushes the ring. The security leave because they only agree to protect Legend during the match but now it's over. It's the same battle we've seen six or seven times already. Slapnuts hits the stroke and has his acoustic equaliser, but he can't use it because now the red shirt security team are here. Why are the security teams getting so much camera time? 
Slapnut starts brawling with one called Kevin Northcutt, which Jarrett wins to end the segment. Scott Hudson in the back now. He's listening in on a conversation between Styles and Russo. It sounds like AJ's been too cocky and Russo's trying to calm him down. Their second match is next. This one is submission only, but it doesn't go to plan because once again, don't look at my ass Siaki attacks Dilo on the ramp and AJ joins in the attack. Siaki is expelled from ringside. I bet Trinity still turns up though. Oh look, there she is. AJ is focused in on Dilo's leg. It's nice to see a submission match where a wrestler is owned in on a body part straight away. Dilo is down getting his legs smashed for 5 minutes before connecting with a 3 quarter net breaker. Dilo hasn't done a single bit of submission work yet so it's not looking good for him. Oh. Dilo manages to reverse a sharpshooter into one of his own. He digs his knee into the back of Styles' head. AJ taps. I guess working a body part is pointless then. They must now have a ladder match to decide the final fall which will be later in this show. Mike Tanay interviews Don Callis who is the new management consultant for TNA. He says he will be the first ever management consultant who understands both wrestling and business. He also hates hardcore wrestling. He doesn't like the cage dancers fighting either. And on that subject, Nurse Veronica is in the ring. Why is she a nurse you might ask, I have no idea. She also has a cheerleader with her because they are the bitch slap girls. She calls out the cage dancers just like every week. The referee grabs a mic and starts a let them fight chant. Trinity also runs out, I guess because she doesn't have any women to actually fight. Trinity kicks one of them in the neck and the other one in the gut. She actually power bombs Lollipop too, I wasn't expecting to see that. What a weird segment, but talking of weird segments, it's the three live crew now. They are in the hood where Road Dog looks really uncomfortable. The other two say they are going to teach him how to be accepted. He interviews a local and asks him if he's packing a gun. The man is offended to be asked. He interviews another who tells him to suck it. He decides to go into a beauty shop for some reason. Now there's a weird shopping montage, he has a makeover. He eventually walks out dressed like something out of Ali G. He tips his drink on the floor and says it's for the homies. The local residents look very bemused. The gifted Glenn Gilberti is in the ring now. How is he gifted? He asks Jeremy Boras to join him. He wants JB to become a ring valet for America's Most Wanted. He hands him some clothes but JB doesn't seem happy about that. This episode has fallen into the bizarre territory. America's Most Wanted jump Gilberti and they strip him for some reason. Diamond and Swinger jump AMW and this has turned into a match. Apparently the tag titles are on the line here. Storm is thrown out of the ring to take out Swinger and Diamond. Harris also dives out of the ring. It's good action for the most part and it gets a good amount of time dedicated to it. It's pretty much game over for the ECW guys when Harris gets the tag. He hits a crossbody for a two. The ECW guys get an almost victory after a super kick before AMW hit the death sentence. They can't get the freak because Glenn Gilberti is back hitting them with a cowbell for some reason. I guess because Storm is a cowboy. Harris is whipped for a while. Storm tries to crawl on top of him to protect him. How cute. Up next it's James Mitchell in the new church threatening Raven. It's a very good promo from James Mitchell. Why does Bulldozer Brian Lee now look like the Hamburglar? Shane Douglas will franchise Raven. It leads to a six man tag between the new church and the gathering. Julio hits the first big move, a diving double clothesline. They clear the ring as Shane Douglas dumps his nappy of anger. The match calms down a bit with CM Punk squaring off with the Slash Man. Punk hits a big T-bone suplex, the crowd chant Pepsi. Punk hits a knee in the corner on a wacky clothesline. He tries to hit a Hurricanrana which is counted into a powerbomb. Hamburglar Brian Lee does some stomps. This guy's moveset sucks. It's quick regular tags from the new church with Punk getting more and more isolated. Slash then accidentally hit Lee with a knee and CM Punk tags Julio. Julio with a lovely spin kick and he keeps spinning with a full Nelson. He's taken out the church all on his own. It's weird at this point in their careers he seems like a bigger star than Punk. His fun doesn't last because the Hamburglar Brian Lee takes him out of the ring and smashes him into the pole. Eye of the Storm from the Slash Man now. Lots of nice high impact moves in this match. Hamburglar Brian Lee really needs to hit the gym. His head looks too heavy for his body. He's like the opposite of me. Fortunately for Julio, Slash misses his swanton bomb and Julio can tag out. Dude, I was watching the NWA TNA show the other day, man. And you know what? Since my stone friend Shannon stole my finishing maneuver, I've gone back to North Carolina and I've given up on life. So Raven's in the ring and he's doing his standard Raven offense. And he chases Shane Douglas to the back. But a hand comes through the curtain and drags Raven away. It looks like gold dust in the 7 gimmick. Punk and Julio manage a dropkick spinebuster combination. But now Shane Douglas is back and he clotheslines Punk out of his boots. Raven makes his return. I've made this clip blue because Raven keeps getting my videos age restricted. He's been beaten down. They set him up against the table but he fires up and fights back. Then there's a ref bump. I'm not sure it's even necessary to bump the ref at this point. 
Raven scores a couple of Raven effects before James Mitchell distracts him. Shane Douglas spears Raven through the table, and the ref is woken up to count the three. If we hadn't had enough weird segments on this show, we'd keep going. There's all these legends from the wrestling business in the ring. I guess we're just forgetting that the Rock and Roll Express joined Russo Sports Entertainment Extreme. Come on, TNA, it wasn't even that long before this. Harley Race is introduced as Kid Cash's music plays over the intro for ages. Eventually, Cash and the big scary dude Abyss make their way out. Cash is smaller than all of these OAPs, including the woman, Sarah Lee. Sarah Lee looks like Jarrett's granny. Cash calls her the original ring rat. He says another has Alzheimer's. Ricky Morton apparently trained Kid Cash in the first place. Cash tells him that he's too good to need a partner. Kid Cash tells Harley Race that it doesn't matter how many titles he's won and he's a disgrace to the industry. Morton calls Cash an ungrateful punk whilst Mike Tanay looks like one of the Cabbage Patch Kids. Cash smacks Morton and he puts Sarah Lee in a chokehold. Eric Watts appears out of nowhere and gives Cash a choke slam. He calls him Kid Ass. Apparently Eric Watts is the new director of authority. Does that mean he's above or below Don Callis? He holds Cash up so Harley Race can smack him one. Raven is back with a gathering to cut a promo. Raven is blue again. Can this guy please stop getting colour? He says next week it will be a Clockwork Orange House of Fun match. He mispronounces it and then says it's just because he's overexcited. Yeah alright Raven, we all make mistakes sometimes. Just the ladder match for the NWA heavyweight title left. Dealer Brown looks very happy during his entrance. AJ doesn't look so happy. We start with some nice usage of the crowd bar in the steps. Dealer with a nice dive into the crowd. AJ tries to come back for suicide dive which is blocked by Dealer of the ladder. Not long later, AJ is able to land a flip dive to the outside and the crowd is squirting with happiness. AJ is now in full control of his chair shots and a ladder is set up in the corner. He promptly throws Dilo into the ladder. It then falls on him to add insult to injury. For the first time, AJ climbs the ladder, which doesn't last long because he's powerbombed. This gives Dilo a chance. He can't manage it either and the ladder is shoved over. Quite a while is wasted as AJ starts looking for a table. That gives Dilo a chance to recover and he sort of back body drops him on the entrance ramp. With AJ on the table, Dilo starts climbing the ladder in the ring, and he jumps with a frog splash. Time seems to freeze for a moment, and it's the lowdown through the table on the outside. That should mean Dilo is about to be the new champion then, right? Well no, because surprise surprise, don't look at my asses here. Dilo might not want to look at this bit either. Siaki shoves the ladder and Dilo flies out the ring bouncing off the table. How many matches has Siaki cost Dilo at this point? Dilo does make it back to the ring and both men are at the top of the ladder. Then both men fall to the mat whilst holding the belt at the same time. Vince Russo rushes out to try and intimidate the referee. It's eventually ruled that Styles is still the champion as it was unclear who's won. To be fair, it was the right call. Enjoyed these three matches though. Let's move on to episode 2. The show will start off with a limo in the parking lot. Out steps Trinity, who's looking like a fucking boss. AJ Styles follows her and says he's done with D'Lo Brown. Sonny Don't Look At My Ass Siaki is also in the limo and he says that today TNA is making a documentary about his life. The problem with Siaki's character is that he's become so deluded at this point he comes across as an idiot. Primetime Elix Skipper opens the show, must be a record to see him two weeks in a row. He faces Jerry Lynn who's suffered so much that he's pretty much worthless to TNA at this point. They aren't hanging around here and Skipper throws him straight away of a butterfly suplex. He can't hit the player of the day as Lynn then rolls him out of a Mahi Straw Cradle. And that's a three in less than one minute. Skipper has the mic and he's a bad loser so he demands to have a two out of three falls match. Seems like TNA are in love with this gimmick right now. The second fall doesn't start well because Lynn hits the back suplex. Skipper retaliates for super kick. The match slows down now. I'm so glad Lynn isn't feuding with fake road rash character just incredible anymore. Skipper stacks Lynn on the rope and hits him with a rope port karakurana, just a two. He flips over the rope and tries to connect with the clothesline, it doesn't look great. Elix Skipper is completely dominating this fall. He connects with the headstand into the leg drop in the corner now. After this long period of dominance, the comeback begins with a Lynn diving DDT. Skipper tries to shut him down with a turtle wheel, which causes a ref bump. Skipper kicks him in the nutsack and wants to hit him with the scales. Lynn promptly boots the scale into his face. The ref wakes up and that's the three. Not often you see a two out of three falls match just be two falls. I guess Skipper is done then. Siaki and Trinity are out to the ring next. He is now referring to himself as Cocky Siaki. He tells us that the ladies love him, and to be fair there's a lot of little girls screaming in the audience. He does a 50 cent impression and sings that he's got the magic stick. Siaki gets serious now and he brags about interfering in all three of the Dilo Brown AJ Styles matches last week. He tells AJ that if it wasn't for him, he would have lost the belt. I thought they were friends, that's interesting. This brings out the champion who looks like someone just dumped in his cornflakes. AJ tells Siaki he knows nothing about being a champion. He tells Sonny he needs to know his role. AJ tells him to carry his bags. Siaki responds by saying, listen kid, I'm Vince Russo's right hand man. He also says they're both in the same playing deck, but Styles is the Joker. 
That causes Styles to slap him. AJ calls Trinity a rat and says he doesn't need either of them. This is such weird friction when both Trinity and Siaki have constantly interfered in his matches and helped him for the last few matches. Anyway, Dino Brown comes out to the ring. He stirs the pot and agrees that AJ doesn't need Siaki or Trinity or Russo. Dino wants to see the old AJ Styles. He reveals that he hasn't been sleeping well because he's disturbed by not knowing who officially won the ladder match. Dino asks for one more match. AJ admits that he almost did lose that match. He agrees to wrestle him one more time for the belt, but this time it's going to be about respect. AJ offers to shake hands and they hug. Siaki jumps Dilo and they all beat up Dilo Brown. Eric Watts makes the save. Big choke slam on Siaki. To be fair, I've dumped on Watts a lot, but he's getting some great crowd reactions. Watts tells us that Styles and Dilo will have another match for the title next week, but the twist here is that no one will be allowed to interfere. What a novel concept, especially the ace hole Sunny Siaki. This starts an ace hole chant in the crowd. The match will also be in a cage. Didn't they already have a cage match? For some reason, Iceberg is back on the show. I have no idea why his last match was truly awful. He is still the backup for Don Callis, the management consultant. He announces that the following match will not be a hardcore match because the people want to see a normal match. Iceberg will be taking on the Sandman. We've hardly seen him since he won the Hard 10 tournament. Sandman tries to use the cane but he can't land a shot anyway. Iceberg is certainly a bizarre looking individual. After hitting a leg drop, Oh god, he misses a senton off the ring apron, and this gets literally no crowd reaction. I'd have thought that would be a big deal. Sandman smashes him into the crowd barrier. In the ring, it's the bulldog from the Sandman. The ref takes Sandman's stick away, so Sandman hits the ref with his hardcore trophy. This is a ref bump. Sandman lands a cane shot and the white Russian leg sweep. The dumbass referee decides to count the three for him. Why wasn't it DQ for smacking the ref with a weapon? Sandman pours beer into his trophy and shares some with the fans. Callus has the mic and says there's going to be consequences for this. He berates Iceberg. He tells him as he lost to a degenerate drunk, he will be punished. Callus puts on a rubber glove and then fires him and shakes his hand. Wow, thanks for coming Iceberg, complete waste of time there. In the back, Shark Boy is crying next to a paddling pool. He misses New Jack. Athena tries to cheer him up with some Hulk hands. Randomly, Norman Smiley walks in and teaches Athena and Shark Boy how to do the big wiggle. They are now a team. The story is basically that Callus is getting rid of the ECW guys, which is why New Jack's gone. Out now, it's Simon Diamond and Johnny Swinger. They have new music telling us not to mess with them because they're from Long Island, New York. Not personally a fan of any of these men, but at least they've been established as a proper tag team, because the tag division is bird turd at this point. They take on the team of Norman, Smiley and Shark Boy. They get jumped straight away. It doesn't help the New Yorkers as Sharky and Smiley suddenly have double team moves, despite never teaming before. Once Norman leaves the ring, Shark Boy starts getting dominated. The Simon series gets a two for the Diamond Man. Sharky suddenly stops Simon and he starts wiggling. Simon says stop dancing or I'll smack you one. There are lots of people with sharp masks in the audience, look pretty weird. After a long period, Sharky gives Swinger a face buster and Smiley has the tag. Big wind up slam on Swinger. Diamond tries a wheelbarrow but he gets spanked instead. Smiley is smashed out the ring and just after it's Sharp with a missile dropkick. Moments later, the New Yorkers win with a DDT flapjack combination. The gifted Glenn Gilberti immediately gets the mic. He brags about beating up America's Most Wanted last week, but more importantly, he wants to whip Jeremy Borash. AMW make the save wearing weird leather hats. It's pretty much the same as last week. Storm has a chance to speak though for once. He says he had worse beatings from his mum. He challenges the New Yorkers to a strap match next week. I think this is where Storm debuts his catchphrase, sorry about your damn luck. Don't think he said it before this, but I could be wrong. I have been before. Russo is interviewed for ages. He says Sports Entertainment Extreme ended because he hates slap nuts. He's still angry about Jeff putting his kids on TV. He keeps talking about the power he has because of the NWA title. You'd think he was the champion the way he's talking. He claims his power meant he got rid of Goldilocks for some reason. I forgot about her. Chris Sabin is interviewed now. He has to face Shawn Michaels' cousin tonight, but he isn't bothered about it. Eric Watts walks up and says Frankie Kazarian will be the special ref for that match. This poor guy, Michael Shane, is constantly being compared to HBK. Those are some big shoes to fill, he's not even afraid of punch in TNA yet. Michael Shane does start out this match well, but soon he gets in trouble. Chris Sabin hits a big springboard dropkick which crashes him in the back of the head. There are some shenanigans running around ringside which leads to a Michael Shane flip dive to the outside. He can't land his next dive because Sabin catches him on the top rope and throws him nutsack first onto the ropes. Check out this massive springboard dive to the outside by Sabin, it feels like he's getting better on a weekly basis at this point. Something new for me now is a net breaker from the middle rope that puts Shane back in control. The flatliner gets him a two count. Chris Saban crushes him with a big DDT now. Referee Kazarian can only count a two. 
Saban goes running. He senses he only needs one last move to put him away, but he runs straight into a sweet chin music. There's lots of unique moves in this match. Never seen a man hit the DDT the way Saban does it here. Saban is supposed to be a heel, but the crowd chant that was free. Chris Saban tries to get disqualified by smacking Kaz out with the belt, but Kaz takes it away and then Shane almost rolls up Saban. Saban kicks Michael Shane down and then he shoves Kaz just once. Kaz flips and hits him with the wave of the future. Michael Shane makes the cover and Kaz tries to count, but another referee arrives and takes Kaz out of the ring. He banishes Kaz away. Saban uses this as a chance to hit Michael Shane with the X Division title and that is the three. Not a bad first match for Michael Shane at all, definitely good stuff to come from him. A video package now promoting Mad Mikey aka Crash Holly. It shows him getting angry at things throughout the day, he completely flips his lid over the most basic of things. My favourite is when his computer from the 1980s doesn't work so he simply picks it up and throws it off a balcony, almost hitting a reversing car in the process. He also gets some fast food but flips when his order contains cheese. He's also annoyed that he didn't get a black and white shake, whatever that is. He climbs into the fast food joint in anger. This whole thing is just hilarious. Big thumbs up to whoever came up with all this stuff. Backstage interview of Ricky Morton. He claims he taught Kid Cash everything he knows, but he didn't teach Kid Cash everything that he knows. It's Kid Cash versus Ricky Morton. Can't believe this guy is still wrestling. He looks 60 years old at this point. What follows is actually quite an impressive wrestling match despite his age. This match contains high risk moves from both guys. I was quite enjoying it, but then the ref is distracted and the monster abyss appears and he kills Ricky Morton. Cash pins him for the three of everyone disgusted. The NWA legends are back trying to confront Cash who gets in their face. Kid Cash is being established as a dick, good stuff. And it must be a record because the next segment is also good. It's the free life crew in the hood again. This time they're at a bar in the hood. They chat up women and get drunk. Mold Dog ends up getting diarrhea from Sambuca, I'm not sure why. Someone in the production team decided to play Miss TNA Bruce's theme, which keeps saying push. The truth is smashed at the bar, Conad is boring and being the responsible one. They all agree to go back to Mold Dog's trailer. These guys are getting better each week. There's a lot going on in this one for sure. The cage dancers are back again. They say it wasn't a fair fight last time because of Trinity, so they must fight all over again. Trinity brings out the nurse Veronica and the cheerleader Valentina. Trinity sends them to the ring. It's a cat fight of whipping and all sorts of stuff. It doesn't last long. I'm surprised it's still going, to be honest. Now it will be a Clockwork Orange House of Fun match. Shane Douglas and the New Church taking on Raven and the Gathering. For some reason, it's Mickey James instead of CM Punk here, so the Gathering are at a massive disadvantage. As I learned from my recent Raven video, I annoyingly have to be careful with what I show here. I've had so many videos age restricted just because of Raven. To be fair, as usual, Mickey James shows she belongs in the match with some of the damage she takes. It's really not talked about how many things she did for TNA in the early days. She gets a massive pop from Slash crushing over the eye of the storm. It's mostly just a typical hardcore match which is essentially all about Raven and Douglas. Raven is hit with a belly to belly, seconds later Julio does a victory roll to avoid a top rope dive. It looks nice but it's not enough to end the match. Mickey almost gets powerbombed out of the ring but she reverses it into a head scissors taking the Slash man out of the ring. Brian Lee floors her. She ducks his next move and Raven and Julio hit stereo super kicks. This is the most hyped I've seen a TNA crowd for any match. Mickey canes her opponents then almost throws the cane in the referee's face. Raven gets Douglas on the table but before he can dive Mickey does diving DDT to Slash then Raven puts Douglas through the table. The mystery man is here again he pulls Raven under the ring maybe it's the rat. Mickey is choke slammed. Julio and the bulldozer take each other out with trash cans. The noise in this building at this point is deafening. No one is moving now. Douglas manages to drape his arm over Raven who has re-emerged and that's the three. Really enjoyable match, the best hardcore match in TNA at this point. D'Lo Brown is interviewed behind a fence. He's just hyping up the match with AJ next week. AJ responds with one of his early wacky TNA promos. He says I took D'Lo Brown's wrestling class and it sucks. Unfortunately all that's left is the main event which is a baseball bat and a guitar on a pole match between Slapnuts and Joe E. Legend. Whoever booked these shows certainly hated Sonny Siaki. He yet again interferes. He's become one of the more annoying characters on this show. He stops Jarrett having the bat. Later, Legend tries to dive with a baseball bat shot, but Jarrett grazes him with the guitar at the same time. As it doesn't break properly, Jeff hits a diving guitar shot. Now it's broken. Slapnuts wins. Christopher Daniels randomly appears in the ring. He hits an Arabian moonsault. Daniels has been built up for the last few weeks with a new religious character, but he's not been wrestling for a while. Legend hits the grease cutter and Daniels hits a diving bat shot to end the show. Good show, but weak main event. That's it for another time. I hope you don't mind the briefness of this video too much. I've just completed an entire week of videos for Week of the Hawk and it's time for a couple of days off. And if you don't like that, get lost.